Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the Tech Fair keynote speaker. Um, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Jennifer James. Dr. Jennifer James is an urban cultural anthropologist who was a professor at the University of Washington Medical School prior to developing her public lectures and seminars which she presents worldwide. She's a specialist in the cultural elements of technological change and marketing intelligence. Her unique background, history, psychology, and anthropology, has made her one of the most sought after women speakers in the world. And we have been courting her for about three years, so we're really excited to host her. Uh, she works extensively with boards and high-level executive groups on strategic planning and international problem solving. Dr. James is a researcher, writer, and commentator. She has published seven books numerous academic articles, and wrote a newspaper column for the Seattle Times for 18 years. Her most recent book is Thinking in the Future Tense, and she is currently completing a new book, Cultural Intelligence. She is the founder of the Committee for Children, a nonprofit organization that for 25 years has developed curriculums for the protection of children and the development of alternatives to violence. These curriculums are taught in every state and in 38 other countries. Um, her talk today is The Human Face of Technological Change. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer James. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, do you need that microphone or do you have a sound system without it? Because I'm thinking I may not need to use the microphone. What do you think? I mean, this room has pretty good acoustics. but. And he's fine as well. All right. So I'll go back and forth to get to the podium. Um, we have a small group, which is a thrill for me, um, because I seem to end up talking normally to, you know, like 500 or once 5,000. Um, and it's not a very intimate experience. You're basically tap dancing and uh, hoping that, you know, the information is getting across. So I'd like to play this by ear. I'd like to treat this more like a seminar. Uh, more discussion. Uh, we probably won't use the whole time because there won't be any reason to. Um, so throughout my at least introductory uh, material, I want you to feel absolutely free to have your own agenda and to assert that agenda so that we get to it. So I'll tell you what I plan to do. Um, I'm an urban cultural anthropologist. And there aren't very many of us. The urban's obvious. I deal with dense populations, which is pretty much becoming the entire world. All right? The cultural is belief systems. Why is common sense not common practice? Why wouldn't every one of your faculty members be using the highest levels of technology that were available in the budget? Right? <laughs> Why would politics? <laughs> All right, moving right along. Um, <laughs> Why would Americans be so anti-education? It just makes absolutely no sense. Why does it take so long to commit to the obvious? Why is there still racism in the United States? Prevalent racism, all right? So anthropologists are interested in the story, I mean cultural anthropologists, the story people have in their gut about the way things ought to be that does not process through the brain. So no amount of reality can change the way people see the world. Um, so that's something I'm particularly um, interested in because we're changing so fast. We've never seen change of the speed. And we'll talk about why. And the internationalism of this change is such that um, this particular kind of cultural resistance uh, is very damaging uh, to my country. So um, urban cultural anthropology, we look at millions of years we look at dense populations, which of course are more recent, and we look at belief systems and why we can't let go of them. The sort of um, tapestry, if you will, uh, uh, of culture. And my specialty is American culture. Um, I'm actually an immigrant from Wales, but been here forever, so I don't think it makes much difference. Um, but I did, I've done field work around the world. Um, uh, my master's in Malaysia. My dissertation uh, was on deviance. I was interested in people who exist on the periphery of cultures. People who either have the courage or just get stuck with a situation where they're defined as deviant and in order to survive have to adapt in different ways. The two areas where I've done most of my research, the first is culture and illness. 
taught in a medical school for 12 years, and I, I was interested in how people literally have belief systems that make them sick. And as we know, in the United States, we have a tremendous problem now with what we used to call iatrogenic illness, illness just generated in the mind, um, or uh, generated by the kind of habits we have, the things that we um, do to ourselves. Diabetes being, you know, one of the ones that's just literally becoming an epidemic. And uh, when you're seeing an epidemic of diabetes in children in a culture, you know that there's an educational problem going on um, here. So I was very interested in that because anthropologists, um, we look at voodoo. <laughs> and with voodoo, if you have low enough self-esteem and high enough guilt, I can kill you. It takes about 48 hours. The mind can literally shut down the body. So culture and illness was my first interest. But it wasn't satisfying enough. I couldn't understand, again, why people, whether as individuals, that's why I did a degree in psychology, or as uh, collectives, why they did things that were clearly not in their own interests. So I began uh, to study in a new area called adaptive strategies. Why is it that some people can see the future and literally make a commitment to it? You know, what, what is it about Bill Gates, or what is it about Branson, or what is it about any of those entrepreneurs or politicians like Nelson Mandel or Václav Havel who can literally see what's coming down the line and commit to it? What do they have? Why can they adapt? And at literally the same time in history, there's a group who absolutely cannot adapt. The Slobodan Milosevic's, let's all go back to the 13th century, right? or any uh, number of individuals. I mean, I could make fun of Sarah Palin. I was raised on a farm. I was a barrel racer. Um, I was Washington State Junior Barrel Race Champion. So Sarah Palin would, was my heroine for about 1900. What you wanted then, in terms of adaptation to the environment and survival, is somebody who could go out in the woods, kill a moose, field dress it, bring it back, make moose stew, pop out five kids, and be sexy. <laughs> that was the absolute ideal. But in 2008, it's like, what? What are we talking about here? If you don't even know geography, there's a slight problem running the United States of America. Um, so I'm interested in that gap, the adaptive gap that we're seeing right now. Some countries moving rapidly ahead because they can see the future. And it's, by the way, it's much easier if your survival's at stake, all right? And countries that cannot and are holding on to the past to the detriment of, of their own um, uh, welfare. Uh, so adaptive strategies is really what we're gonna be talking about today. And I wanna talk to you about where we are and where we're going and what's getting in the way. And technology, um, I mean, I mentioned the, we're changing at the speed of light, uh, and the number one reason, of course, is technology. It's absolutely extraordinary. We have never, millions of years, we have never seen change of this magnitude, this breadth, this depth. We had literally millions of years to get from sort of hunting and gathering to horticulture, where you more or less stayed in a certain region. We had millions or thousands of years to get from horticulture to agriculture, which is when we developed some kind of urban presence uh, and specialization. We had hundreds of years to get from agriculture to urban industry, the assembly line, but we've had what? 30 years, 30 years to get from agriculture and urban industry into where we are now. Brains, technology, and services is what you're all about. And because of the communication links, it's international. And it's international at a level that I, I don't think we could have ever dreamed of. When I grew up, the way you got to China was you dug a hole in your backyard. <laughs> right? I'm sure that metaphor is meaningless to many uh, young people. They don't even know what we're talking about. Now I could just take my cell phone and dial a friend in China, and we could all chat. It's worldwide. We now have the largest peer group of adolescents the world has ever seen, and they're connected. Not all of them, but many of them are connected. What does it mean if a 14-year-old in Indonesia can talk to a 14-year-old here? 
it changes the world. Because the 14 year olds, maybe they start talking about music, maybe they then start talking about sex, maybe then they talk about clothing or jeans or whatever, you know, the universals, but sooner or later they start talking about reality. And the Indonesian kid gives the American kid his version of history and vice versa, and then they find out they're all being lied to. <laughs> and that their teachers are not honest brokers of history, may not be honest brokers of science, are probably not honest brokers of economics, um, and are not honest brokers of reality. And so you have this peer group, a significant percentage of worldwide, who are online and have access to information. They may not have access to all the skills needed to process that information, but there is no question that they believe they can synthesize it, they believe they can process it, they believe they can test it, and they believe that talking to each other is going to give them more straightforward information than talking to anyone else. It's absolutely mind-blowing. It's the reason that change is going so fast. When you have cultures breaking through the filters of their belief systems and connecting online, whatever the age group, you have change that is just going to roll over us almost like a hurricane. Just choo. I, uh, some years ago, was um, in South Africa and um, doing a series of um, lectures and they didn't have much money. So they said, we really want you to come. And of course, I was after apartheid, so I said, okay, I'll come. Um, I hadn't been um, to South Africa and uh, they said, what do you want? I said, oh, give me a safari. I'd never been on a safari. So I took my son and after we did the speeches, they sent us to Tanzania. And uh, we're in tents, you know, there's about 12 of us. And we're in the middle of nowhere in the Serengeti, and I'm just so excited, right? It's just such an amazing kind of thing. And my son's getting a little bored, so he goes to the bar to talk to the pilots and the head guides. But that evening, they had brought the Maasai young men in to do their sort of thing for the tourists. And, you know, the Maasai are these, you know, seven foot tall, you know, beautiful. And we'd gone by their village in the jeeps and they live in mud huts. They don't have generators, they're basically herders. Um, and um, they don't have any kind of technology, not the most fundamental technology that we had maybe 200 years ago. But after their presentation, I see this Maasai kid with a laptop that he's borrowed from the guide. And using the satellite thing that the guide has, he's Googling the universe. Can you imagine that? That transition, it just blew my mind. What are you going to be able to say to that young man when he can Google the world? When he can connect? This is the last generation that will be able to lie so successfully. <laughs> and that is an extraordinary, extraordinary change because culture is sometimes lies. Now, it isn't that they're bad, all bad lies. Please understand, this is how we organize, how we interpret our world, how we build relationships, you know, our explanations. There's a lot of very good things about mythology and about stories and about culture. I'm not throwing it out. I'm just saying it's also an extremely useful mechanism for lying. They just had a vote, for example, in North Carolina. Um, and the number one group that voted against um, gay marriage, um, and it doesn't matter how you feel about gay marriage, I'm just using this example, um, uh, were African Americans, African American Christians, who have a very strong story about that and do not bridge it to their own experience. Okay? Now, a whole bunch of white people voted against it too, so I mean, or for it, whichever the way the initiative went. Um, but these belief systems are extremely um, powerful. I'm not really worried about gay marriage because they'll keep doing it, you know, or they'll go up to Canada or, you know, people want to do those things, they're going to do those things. And it's like don't ask, don't tell. Um, eventually they said you can tell on weekends, right? And now apparently you can tell anytime. I mean, it's just, you can predict the trajectory of most cultural elements, all right? What you can't predict is the timing. In other words, how long it's going to take. So what an anthropologist like, like me does is try to essentially tell you where we're going. 
And that's what I thought would be useful to you in terms of your own lives, in terms of your students, um, in terms of education in general, is why are we here, how do we get here, and where are we going? And um, hopefully, um, it's based on um, uh, research, but perhaps uh, a more honest way of describing what I'm doing is it's based on trends. It's based on the fact that Homo sapiens has been doing this for millions of years, and it's relatively easy to project the future from the past. Let me give you an example. Um, since I brought up gay marriage, just because it's been in the news, let's take 112 years of American history around who we have decided is a citizen or a colleague or allowed to be a student, okay? Now, not all of you have been around all that time, but in 1900, in California, yeah, you could shoot people of Chinese descent. You could kill them and nobody minded. There was a huge group of Chinese that came over from uh, ports like Canton to work on the railroad. And they weren't, of course, seen as regular human beings. And so if you, they irritated you or whatever, and there was a $50 bounty on Native Americans. There's a reason why there are fewer Native Americans in California compared to virtually any other place in the United States <laughs> because we, you killed them all, but not you. I understand that. Um, in fact, there is that wonderful book, Ishii, you know, the last um, Native American. I mean, he wasn't the last, but he certainly seemed to be. Uh, but in 1902, uh, California said, no, we can't shoot Chinese people anymore. You have to think about it first. And in 1905, they took the bounty off Native Americans. In 1920, uh, across the United States, women got the vote. All right? and we may someday, you know, um, have a president. Uh, at 1930s, um, working men said, we're going to organize. And it was the beginning of backing off of a 55-hour work week. Now, many have gone back to work 55 hours a week, but apparently it's voluntary now. All right. Um, uh, 1940s uh, was the uh, Native Americans got basic civil rights after World War II. A lot of uh, it was really these wonderful cultural stories, like the the talkers, you know, the ability uh, of the Navajo to do the um, um, special kind of uh, language uh, for intelligence services in World War II, it did, you know, or Jim <laughs> Thorpe, whatever way you want. It's it's amazing what. Kind, how a story will take your gut and completely shift it. That's why culture is so powerful. Uh, so 1950s, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights, uh, really a monumental shift. 1960s of women equal pay for equal work, they're still arguing about that. 1970s, um, look at the trajectory now, look at the direction, look at how culture changes. Okay, 1970, two things, um, seniors, all of a sudden, you couldn't kill Granny anymore, and they started talking about you know having regulations in nursing homes and things like that, and animals. Now I was raised on a farm, and we always thought you had to take care of animals; it was an economic necessity. But now, animals in this long sequence, because we've got 70 years now in the sequence I'm trying to show you, it was it's more about life. Once your stomach is full you start thinking about other things. And many kids in the 40s and 50s were still trying to eat. And that's still, of course, happening somewhat in the United States and certainly around the world. But in the 1970s, you start thinking about what we were eating, and then you got things like free-range chickens. You can go to Trader Joe's, and you can buy naturally nested hen eggs with or without access to roosters. <laughs> now that means fertilized or not fertilized. I don't know if it means the chickens are happy or not. But think of the complexity of that idea. We vote now, state by state, on how big a pen we're going to allow for a pig. We vote state by state against veal, against you know making geese or ducks or whoever eat more than they would like to eat. We vote on uh, uh, how we kill cat cattle. When we first came to the United States, my father, who had been a policeman in London, could not get a job, so he became a killer on the floor at Armour Star. And the way they killed then was the uh, cow came up a ramp, and a man with a sledgehammer was at the top of the ramp. 
And, you know, he was a very powerful man, and he prided himself on being able to, you know, do it humanely. <laughs> but we don't do that anymore, right? Uh, extraordinary changes in our view. It is a felony in the state of Washington where I live, a felony to drown a kitten. It's called the Posada Law, after some kids that beat up a donkey. Um, this is the, how powerful single stories are. So you can imagine the trajectory of this continuing concern about various human beings, but also various animals. It's not just dolphins anymore, dolphin free tuna. Why did dolphins get so much attention? Not because we think they might be sentient, they had a television show. <laughs> At the same time that Flipper was telling this new story about dolphins, Charlie, for those of you old enough to remember, the tuna wanted to be caught and cut up and put in a can. <laughs> he wanted to be good enough for Starkist. We have more endangered tuna species than we have endangered dolphin species. Right? The story, the cultural belief system is so powerful. All right, so 1980s, most of you are alive by now. Americans with Disabilities Act. Again, distance learning is a wonderful element in that. But who thought there was any need for curbs, wide doors, you know, rails in the toilets? Who thought there was any need for all of that? I didn't. They had television. I thought they were happy at home. Think about it. I had a friend who was a quad, and we'd go downtown, and he would had a tube that we just put in the trees in downtown Seattle. Or if we needed to go up a curb, we recruited two or three guys, and we got the wheelchair over the curb. It wasn't until they were on I-5 blocking traffic in their wheelchairs that it occurred to me that something was wrong. And what was wrong is that it wasn't accessible. Now there's still, I think they have too many parking places, don't you? <laughs> They're always empty. No, That's gallows humor. You have to laugh about the absurdity of how cultural systems operate. All right, so we've got through the 80s, we're now in the 90s. Who in the 90s did we um, add to whose kind of normal citizenry that you're willing to, you know, eat with or work with or have in your classes or whatever? Who did we add in the 90s? Because California did it, so. San Francisco? We've already talked about it. Gays. And since we've joked about don't ask, don't tell, I won't take it any further, but they become legitimate. They're all over the place. Uh, isn't it wonderful? I mean, my, I mean, in high school, of course, we didn't even know about that stuff. But that's because I graduated in 1960. But I had a wedding, of, uh, I guess, three or four years ago, maybe five times, of um, two um, of my neighbors who were gay, Paul and Bill. And, and uh, Paul is a thoracic surgeon. And he'd been kicked out of the military in Iraq <laughs> because was this? He, someone's got an email. I mean, he'd never done anything. He's very quiet. You'd think they needed thoracic surgeons in Iraq, wouldn't you? All right. But anyway, he and Paul wanted to get married, and I have a big garden, so they got married. And it was very interesting. There were all these people standing around, maybe about 40 people. And we were all watching the couple, and they were talking to each other. And at some point, it was like there was this ripple, like a sea change in all of us, and we understood what we were witnessing wasn't just some kind of new thing in America, but love. It was literally transforming. I'd been running around, you know, cleaning this, cleaning that, and making everything look nice. I didn't stop to think about what was going on, and I felt it. And the whole group changed. The symbol as well as the story. All right, so now we're at um, um, 2000. So 2000, I'll just save you the energy. I'll do the work this time, but I'm going to make you work later. Um, transgender. Now, I would have thought that would have been tough, but now if you're a faculty member here, as long as you time it right, you can be Stan in May and Susan in September. Teachers are doing it all over the place. I don't know what it is about teaching. The first group that I worked with were Boeing engineers. And they were 10 to 1 becoming women. Most gender identity switches are men becoming women, 10 to 1. 
And I know all this because uh, uh, when I was at the medical school, they recruited me for a thing called the Gender Identity Committee. They had only men on it. They had a urologist and a plastic surgeon and a this and that on it, and they had no women on it. That's because there were no women teaching in the medical school. I was the first woman teaching core courses in the University of Washington Medical School. That's how old I am. <laughs> so they said, oh, we've got a woman, and we're making all these women. We're switching all these men into women, and there are no women on our committee. <laughs> and of course, these transgendered people had figured that out, so they were coming in, in totally stereotypical lace outfits, you know, because you have to cross-dress for two full years before the committee will consider you. But what was interesting was the number of Boeing engineers. And um, so finally Boeing called me in and they said, we don't know what to do. Because you said they have to cross dress, but they're still men and we only have male bathrooms and female bathrooms. We have no middle of the road bathrooms here. <laughs> and what, what should we do? Well, what have hospitals done about that? Everybody uses the same bathroom. But that is terrifying to some people, absolutely terrifying. I mean, women don't want to see urinals. It turns out men don't like urinals that much anymore. <laughs> um, most people would just soon have a door. But unisex is a really scary thing. But women on a regular basis now get tired of lines and they go into men's bathrooms. I mean, so give it up, it's almost over. Uh, so we finished 2000, let's get to 2010. That's where we'll stop. What? would you guess is the next group that is going to try to get the story about their own civil rights uh, changed? And I'll give you a few hints. It has to be a relatively large group. Um, and um, the demand for civil rights has to be legitimate. All right? And it's a group that at the po point in time when they're starting to talk about this um, are considered, you know, deviant or unacceptable or, you know, in some ways not deserving of. And think I've shown you from 1900 all the way up to 2010 how cultures change. So you know they're going to change. You can predict the future. But before you do, you get very resistant. Before you suddenly say, oh, well, all right, let them get married, you have votes saying, no, 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 it's threatening me. Dogs and cats will want to get married. <laughs> I actually, I'm married, but I have a lovely little dog, a little Havanese. And I occasionally, when I'm holding Tashi, think about a permanent <laughs> relationship. <laughs> you know, I'm not interested in sex anymore, but the point is, is I love this furry little thing. I'm being silly, but Santorum was worried that you know you might want to marry a horse or something. So I thought I'd toss that in. Um, and by the way, at the speed we're changing, if you can't laugh at most of this, you're going to have a very hard time. And one of the things that's happening in America right now is the inability to laugh at this absurdity. The fact that people are taking absurd things very seriously is causing them a lot of grief and a lot of pain. And I don't want anyone to have that. Life's tough enough you know, without that. All right, so we're back to 2010. And uh, wh what is this group that's now demanding civil rights that we sort of don't think deserves them? Real, it's, what's interesting is we have the largest group of these people in the entire world. Did, were you, no, you're just throwing I would say um, overweight people. Well, they're, they, you know, they are uh, uh, definitely discriminated against, but everyone thinks it's sort of their own fault. So I'm thinking of a group where society has sort of officially gone after them. Yes? Prisoners. Yes, prisoners. And I wouldn't be surprised if um, we're going to see body image coming up in the future. I think you made a good statement. But what I'm alluding to are prisoners. We lock up more people than pretty much the entire rest of the world put together. And certainly percentage by population. We're, we're ten times ahead of any other country, even in times of revolution and war. We lock a lot of people up. So the issue now that's happening on a state-by-state -state basis is whether once you've served your time, you're going to ever get your civil rights back. I personally you know, have certain categories like child molestation where I would just lock them up you know, or shoot them. <laughs> um, so it's not like I'm soft on crime. But many states, if you have committed any kind of a crime, 
you know, like our silly marijuana stuff, um, you don't get to vote then for the rest of your life. Or they create an arduous like five or six year process that you may or may not. And in Florida, if you all remember, one of the ways that the Florida election swung to um, President Bush was because 55,000 people had been taken off the voting rolls uh, and accused of being felons. It turned out the vast majority of them weren't felons. All right, so it's a very powerful kind of thing. And suppressing the votes of certain groups serves certain kinds of interests. So what I will guarantee you will see over the next decade is huge and louder and louder movements for the restoration when earned and when appropriate of civil rights for people who have uh, served their time. But the only reason I gave you that kind of little demographic tour is most of the things we're going to talk about here are like that. You can see where we've been and you can see where we're going and you can see the tremendous resistance. Uh, and the reason there is resistance is almost always a combination of cultural belief system. So it may be a very honest thing, you know, my God doesn't want me to do this or, you know, I really feel yucky about it because at eight years old my daddy told me or mommy it was yucky. Or uh, it's about power. And it's frequently about power, about who's at the top of the hierarchy and who's in control. Now, any group that's gaining power, and this is around the world, so think of youth in Egypt. Any group that is gaining power is just loving it. Even if you're hungry, even if you can't get the education if you want, even if the future is not going to be as good for you as maybe your kids, if you see that the direction culturally is in your favor, it just gives you power. I mean, when you see the videos in the 1950s and 60s of what uh, African American young people went through, and then you see them smiling, you understand that the future looked good. The future looked good at that time in history. So groups that believe that by their own effort they're gaining power are extremely positive. And I'm telling you that because groups that believe they're losing power will do virtually anything to stop that from happening. And so these two things are going at the same time. I mean, they will kill. They will use apartheid. They will uh, do everything they can to deny the vote. Uh, I mean, they will gerrymander. They will find any possible way um, to do that. And by the way, it happens on both sides of the political um, uh, spectrum. Uh, it happens more on the side that has the sense that they're losing power. Uh, but nobody sort of gets exonerated in this. Um, so I think it's important to understand um, that resistance to change, even if I take an example from um, people resisting the new technology. Um, and you know, sometimes I do. I mean, I raise chickens, take the girl out of the farm, but not the farm out of the girl. I mean, there's something about the clucking that makes me feel safe. Um, we all need those things to hold on to, but the main resistance for, for um, main resistance to technological innovation in the classroom or to distance learning um, is really about a loss of power, about an anxiety that you can't do it as well as the five-year-old. How many of you can beat a five-year-old at Nintendo or virtually any computer <laughs> game? Who, who thinks you can regularly beat a five-year-old? See, I rest my case. I mean, some of you are being, you know, humble. But I have grandchildren, and they're better than I am at most everything. I used to be good at, at Tinker Toys and, you know, Lincoln Logs and Legos. But now, Legos are these big complex kits with books you have to go through. I'm not allowed to do anything but sort by color. <laughs> and we're talking five-year-olds. And, you know, these kids are texting, and I thought, I can't text, I've got arthritis, but in order to, you know, I've got seven grandchildren, I want to talk to them. They don't even email, so I had to get, even get a little stylus thing so I could um, do the texting. But it is a loss of power, and what comes with that is a loss of confidence. And so it seems so much easier to march in front of a class um, without using the technology. 
Now you're probably saying, but she doesn't have PowerPoint, and I'll tell you why I don't have PowerPoint. It puts people to sleep. <laughs> it's using technology when you need to use technology. And I do a lot of distance learning, and I think that is a wonderful um, aspect. All right, so um, where we are, where we're going, and perhaps the most important thing um, is that in times of rapid change, people become very anxious, people want things simple, and Americans in particular want things simple. And the reason is we've been enormously successful as a culture and a country. And it's been a straightforward success. And you know, the uh, historians and, and the others can argue about, you know, we had all these resources or we had this wonderful energy of the nature of immigrants or however you want to describe the American experience, if you've been on the top for a very long time and you felt you deserved to be on the top, it becomes a very easy and simple thing to explain that that's why you're there and that you'll always be there. When you get change of this magnitude and you're starting to slip, and data-wise, reading, math, health care, uh, uh, income inequality, maternal death rates. I mean, you can list virtually anything. We are way down. In some cases, we're 24th, we're 25th. Um, write down this note because I think it'll be useful for you. Um, type in, Google a thing called American Shame. And this is a chart. Let's find it. I got it here, I'm pretty sure. This is a chart. Um, compiled by the Central and the CIA, because the CIA thinks it's tremendously important that they know um, how we're doing uh, in comparison to other cultures. And I was going to get to it later, so let's see where I put it. Ta-da! Okay. Um, so its actual title is, oh, it's the International Monetary Fund, uh, and also the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, but the way you Google it is American shame. And they took American what? shame, S-H-A-M-E, um, and they created this handy dandy chart, which of course I should have had on PowerPoint and could have projected onto a screen. Um, but uh, these are just a few of the things. They asked questions in 30 countries, income inequality, unemployment rate, level of democracy, well-being index, life expectancy, prison population, and student performance in math and science. All right? And at the top, Australia, Canada, Norway, Netherlands, in virtually all of these um, categories. And then there's a whole bunch of people in the beginning. At the bottom um, uh, is the United States. Uh, not in everything, but we're at the bottom, uh, for example, in income inequality. Now, you know, they don't have, they have Slovenia in here, but they don't have um, Romania. <laughs> you know, it's mostly um, first world countries. All right. um, life expectancy at birth, we're kind of um, uh, in the middle, we're doing fine there. Uh, student performance, we're around 23, 24, we're not uh, in math and science. Um, Exxon's now doing an ad about that. You see it all the time. It's a, a public service announcement. Have you seen it where they talk about the importance of teachers and the importance of our uh, uh, math scores? And um, in, uh, we're in the middle to, to near the top in well-being, which Americans feel good about themselves. And they, for the most part, feel good about their lives. But how much of it is actually based on, on reality? Um, life expectancy, what is it, 82 in Australia. 81.29 in um, Canada uh, and 78 in the United States. All right, so we're not doing so bad. Uh, let's see, who's dying? Well, I've got to find somebody lower than us. Oh, there's nobody lower than us. We have the uh, shortest life expectancy uh, um, of any of these countries, Australia, Canada, Norway, Netherlands, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Denmark, Finland, Belgium, Malta, Japan, Sweden, Hong Kong. I wouldn't think Hong Kong. My God, Hong Kong, they live three years longer. Iceland, New Zealand, Luxembourg, United Kingdom, Ireland, Singapore. Czech Republic. 
Uh, oh, yeah, we got Czech Republic had, uh, oh, you're right. They are worse than we are by uh, three quarters of a year. Good for you. Cyprus? Cyprus is, is like 0.10 below us. South Korea, Italy, Italy's doing great, so is France. Uh, Czech, no, we already did that. Slovenia is below us, thank you very much. Taiwan is the same. Slovakia, they're a little bit below us. Spain, they're doing better. Greece, they're doing better. And Portugal's doing better. Um, I'm only sharing you, but with this, so that the reality, the data, and of course, who knows about this kind of data, compared to the feeling, um, uh, the story uh, uh, that we have about our well-being. So why am I even bothering with any of this? Because your job at this school is to be able to tell a story. And the better job you do in telling a story, because people can't hold all the data in their head. What they need is a story that makes them want to be in your class and makes them want to be in your school and makes them want to be successful. A story about where the, we are and where we're going. And if educators can't do that, we're in just huge trouble. And a story requires three things. And that's what I hope to give you today. The first is a set of ideas that actually fit the future. The second is those ideas have to resonate to deeply held values. The values of the culture that you're in. And third, the person telling the story, that's you, has to be able to tell it with integrity, with commitment with energy. So if you're not using the technology that's appropriate for what you're doing, then you're not teaching with commitment. You're not teaching with the energy available. You're not teaching with integrity. And the problem we have now is young people, now I know we have a lot of older people going to community colleges, but young people know that immediately. Six-year-olds know it. One of the problems we're having in our educational system in the United States is we have six-year-olds going into first grade who are technologically more competent than their teachers. And these kids come in with all this energy, high protein intake, and it's not matched by the teacher's energy. This mismatch, when it happens that early, creates a tremendous amount of tension. And we call it ADD. Now, I'm well aware that there is such a thing as ADD. But if you go around the world, let's take Finland, the ADD rate is like 0 0.04. If you add up the various kinds of ADD you know, things in the United States, it gets into the 20, 22%. What's going on? In Detroit, it's over 50%. Why would all these American kids have all these learning disabilities and the Finn kids don't? Well, Finns are totally committed to education. They have the best educational system in the world, so all their cultural stories are giving the kids the cultural codes for learning, probably by two years of age. There's a lot of cultural advantage. It's the homogeneous culture. They don't let different people in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you exclude all of the advantages that Finland has, you still have to look at the United States that is defining enormous numbers of its kids as having learning disabilities without looking at whether there's an energy mismatch. High energy, technically uh, uh, competent. We have three-year-olds that are regularly on computers. We have two-year-olds using iPads. My grandchildren, two and three years old, can pick up an iPad if mom and dad are busy and call up uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. And once they're watching Jack and the Beanstalk, and they can either have it read to them they can, if they're old enough, try and read it themselves. Um, but they can touch the screen and on any part of it, and they'll show them more pictures of it. So that if you touch the cow, you can learn about cows. If you touch the bean seed, you learn about, more about beans. I mean, these kids are absolutely amazing. I'm always saying, oh, let's curl up with a book. And there's a place for books, and they still like books. Um, but they also like the control that they have on that. Now if they go into a classroom and the, the skill level they already have is not matched, then that causes tension. And a lot of younger kids literally drop out. They feel they're being parked. 
And this is not a generation that likes to be parked. And the same thing happens really all the way um, up until you get to what, I don't know, 34, 35, oh, whatever. <laughs> People start getting um, um, tired. So the importance of being able to tell a story and to tell it with integrity in education now involves technology. Comfort with it. It's fine if you're not very good at it. I'm not very good at it. What isn't fine is not being willing to learn, letting even six-year-olds teach you. That's what I do. Uh, and being willing to participate in the process. Uh, I'll never have the skill level that these kids have, but I'll always be willing to participate and, and to learn and to sort of do my best. And that's what I mean by integrity. These kids can smell if you don't have integrity. And it's our fault. This is the most sensitive generation of kids psychologically we've ever seen, and it's our, and it's our fault. We told them as little kids, how do you feel? Everything going all right with you? Let us know if you think somebody's bothering you or somebody's scaring you. I mean, this is all good stuff. Listen to your gut. Listen to your intuition. Nobody wanted me to listen to my intuition as a kid. And I grew up where kids were seen and not heard. If you even spoke up under some circumstances, in my family got your face slapped. My father had arms 10 feet long. <laughs> Now you can't hit your kids now because you short circuit their communication skills. Um, it's a whole new world. We have not only changed how we parent because we have a much more complex personality. They're going to work in more complex areas. If you're working on a farm, it's a whole different kind of a, a responsibility. By the way, a very good one. I learned responsibility on the farm. You have to, no matter how sick you are, get up and feed the animals. Uh, but we're now talking about a much more complex work environment. So we're raising more intelligent kids, mo emotionally intelligent kids that can manage themselves in complex circumstances. And that's changing the way we're parenting and the way we're teaching, the way we're coaching. Remember the old style coach? You grab a guy by the face mask, slap him upside the head, and tell him he's crap. You get out there. That's the way it was in high school. Uh, you could be Bobby Knight, you could throw chairs. And then, you know, all of a sudden the world changed. He had got sent to Lubbock. Now I know he got out of Lubbock, but he was an abusive coach. And he had to change. In the old days, an abusive coach was a good coach. He's tough, but we love him. We love him. Now they sue you. I mean, it's a whole different world. And it's going to keep going that direction because a brain's technology and services economic system requires a different personality. The nerds will inherit the earth. Now hopefully we have nerd athletes, right? Hopefully we're talking about well-rounded personalities. But a quadriplegic with high level technological and communication skills is a more valuable worker than an able-bodied individual without those skills. And that is almost a complete reversal in, what, 30, 40, 50 years. It's extraordinary. It's just like the forklift truck eliminated the strength differential. You give a woman a position in a forklift truck, she doesn't need to ask a man to take the lid off. I mean, it's a whole different relationship. I remember 30 years ago, I was at Oregon Steel, and the story was, you know, Oregon Steel would never hire a woman. And they brought me in, you know, God knows why, and um, that came up. Well, we're glad you're here, and this stuff's all interesting on sex roles, but we aren't going to hire women. I said, well, what are you advertising for? What jobs do you have right now outside of the office? And this guy said, well, we need two crane operators. And I said, what does a crane operator do? Said, well, apparently they do this with one wheel, and this and then they do something with their left foot, <laughs> and then they have to do something with their right foot. I said, oh, that's a woman on the phone cooking dinner with two kids. <laughs> <laughs> and what was so interesting is a good part of the audience immediately got it. And three months later, I got a letter from the guy that had hired me, and he said, we are training two women crane operators. Because we realize they have the skills, because the crane doesn't require brute strength. The technology has eliminated the strength differential. So, and it's an extraordinary kind of shift. And as the cultural story changes, 
what we have seen, which I think is wonderful, this is a big um, uh, research thing that was on TV this morning since I was in the hotel room, that um, the number of men choosing to be at home and, and be parents and how comfortable it is in this sort of new partnership world. In my social circle, out of our six closest couple, um, uh, five of them, the woman works and the man does not. He works. It's just a different kind of work. My husband retired and he's a cook. It's absolutely fabulous. I was so tired of cooking. Um, and he's tutoring, as we speak, um, our oldest grandchild. He tutors him in math and chemistry. Uh, he was a molecular um, biologist. Uh, so when the story changes and the technology allows it to change, um, the whole world changes. So I I'm going to go to questions in a minute, but I want to, before we go to the next section, I want to talk about what you do. Education is absolutely crucial in times of great change because it's the civilizing process. What you do is you control anxiety in the face of threat. What knowledge does is allow whole populations to handle fear in the face of threat. And many, many people in our country today and around the world feel threatened. And you can either go to war or you, know, you can do yourself in or do someone else in, but the civilizing element throughout time has been education. The ability to come to a community college and quell your anxiety to feel that you can adapt and survive. Um, so in, in my mind anyway, what you do is absolutely um, heroic uh, in channeling this anxiety and in literally choosing not to go mad. Uh, we have a lot of people right now in our country that I think are nuts. They haven't, good people. The point is, is they've been driven mad by the speed of change, by the redefinition of, of deviance, by the questioning of religion. Mad to the point that there are many states where I go and I meet with superintendents of school districts and I am warned not to talk about evolution. Now, evolution, I think you all know, is the foundation of biology. Biology is the foundation of medicine. So if you're going to the doctor, you ought to believe in it. <laughs> but also, the biggest new industry on the horizon is, of course, biotechnology. And if you thought cheap microchips changed the world, cheap biochips are truly going to change the world. So they always tell me, you know, we teach intelligent design, you know, we kind of don't talk a lot about evolution, and you know, these are the hot buttons here, let's say Nebraska. So I always go in and talk about evolution, usually in the first half hour. <laughs> and I say, you know, it's just a theory. And they all kind of relax. And I say, just like gravity. <laughs> so why don't we all go up on the roof of the building and push each other off? It's absolutely absurd to not be an honest broker of science. But in times of great change, the anxiety level is so high that we will refuse knowledge. And if anything, it's increasing um, because we're desperately trying to find our, our grounding in an increasingly secular universe where explanations are coming from science, not coming from a felt storyboard, as I learned you know, in Sunday school. Uh, the secularization of the world, Joseph Campbell warned us about it. Joseph Campbell said, if you give up the myths, particularly the myths, the cosmology, the myths about the creation of the world, you will be alone. You will be the first generation that's alone in the universe. And some of you, he said, will be prepared. You will be able to take some of the old stories and what you see of the new story, and you will weave your own story, you know, the earth stewards, or, you know, Buddhism, which gives you lots of freedom. Um, but some of you will not, and you will want to go backwards. This room contains the first generation that has ever been asked to 
come up with their own explanations for the universe, to use their own mind and their own knowledge. Also, what's in their gut, uh, if they were raised as I was, my daddy was a Baptist, my mother was an Episcopalian, um, to sort out philosophically who and what they are and what kind of world they're in. Instead of asking someone, like a priest, um, you know, or an oracle, <laughs> or someone else. We have never had the temerity, I mean, the, the gall to ask these questions ourselves. So this is an extraordinary time in history. And education, um, what you do, however you do it on a daily basis, um, uh, is tremendously crucial in what is, in my mind, a time of diminished understanding. And the reason it's a time of diminished understanding is what we've talked about since we started. The sheer speed of change, so none of us can process it, all right? And um, uh, the loss of power of our own culture, our own country, and the fear that that engenders. And then the anxiety that we will not be able to handle this complexity. Complexity is very difficult. Most people, if they're offered complex answers will, versus simple answers, We'll choose simple gut answers versus the ambivalence that comes with sorting out complex answers. And there's about a hundred other reasons. But this is a time of diminished understanding and a time of less faith in education, less support for education, when you're absolutely vital to our moving through this difficult time. So I'm going to stop here because I want to talk to you, uh, not just talk at you. But what we're going to do when I continue is we're going to be talking about how we change, how we adapt. I'm going to give you a quick formula so you can see exactly where we're going uh, as a culture. And then I'm going to talk about how we do it as individuals. Because if you can understand what's happening to you, you'll be able to understand what's happening to your students. And if you can identify what stage they're in, you'll be much more helpful to them. And the same is true of our culture. Otherwise, you, you will lose your optimism. You will really lose your belief that things zigzag, but things are going in the right direction. And there is a kind of depression or free-floating anxiety right now in the United States, and a tremendous amount of anger. And um, being able to deal with that, I think, is really important <laughs> for your students and for your health. All right, so before we go into where we're going, how about any questions or discussion on what I've talked about so far? Yes? Well, I was just going to bring up this, this then explains the deinvestment in education in a, in a yes. place like California. Yeah. So is it the cultural mindset then that there's so much fear that, you know, we just have to put a halt on the purveyors of education, the purveyors of information or knowledge and deinvest in it so that we can stop it? Is that? A well, I have a whole list of reasons why. Let's see where I put it. I'm sorry that I see if she had a computer and had done it the right way, I'm, I'm guilty of the very things I'm talking about. Because I have a list of, of why we resist education. Ah, here it is. Let's see, there's hope. Right. She shuffles her papers. OK. You have raised a crucial point. Why don't we support education? Because most of the other countries on that list, not all of them, but most of them, think the number one way out of their troubles is education. Finland, which doesn't have much trouble other than a certain depression because the sun doesn't come out, um, Finland will take you all the way through medical school at no cost if you're competent. Imagine that. They have the finest education system in the world. Virtually every Finn is guaranteed an education from prenatal on all the way through to medical school. It's absolutely astounding. And they're the top of all the lists in, in their success rate on the tests or however you want to measure what people know. But here's what I, I made this list. Um, uh, one, we're not as hungry and as poor <coughs> as we once were. So there's a certain level of satisfaction, a certain feeling that what we are now will just kind of continue. There'll be more stuff at Walmart. And so how important is education? And, and all these people have gotten a lot of stuff without being educated. Um, American exceptionalism, it's, the same, it's another version of this. We're just born with it. We don't have to go to school. Um, we cheer the self-made man. 
We absolutely love that. What did Santorum say and get cheered for saying? When Obama or someone had said, um, we want to make education accessible for all Americans, college. And what did he say? He's elitist. He said, what is not? This is a presidential candidate in 2012 saying a college education means you're a snob. That is what I mean by American exceptionalism. Um, we don't have a cultural belief system in anything but middle, minimal education. We do not like intellectuals. Al Gore and, and Kerry, classic examples. Intellectuals are cool, intel, uh, meaning cold. Intellectuals are boring. Um, intellectuals will, you know, talk you down. Um, we much prefer a cowboy. What's so interesting is if you put a cowboy hat on someone in America, and remember, I was raised riding horses. I mean, I love cowboys. My husband says if we're at a bar and they put on walls across Texas, anyone in the bar could take me home. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's that cowboy thing is really deep inside, is what I'm trying to say. You know, we all have music that does that. But I grew up dancing in Grange Halls, all right? So, it's 2012. Luckily, you know, Obama would look ridiculous in a cowboy hat, but I'd almost put money that you're going to see when I met Romney sooner or later. <laughs> okay? Because that's very much a part of the American tradition. So if you put... Uh, Gore and Kerry versus George W. Bush in a cowboy hat. Look at the icons. George Bush thought education was silly, you know, for himself. Uh, and um, of course, he's afraid of horses. I don't know if you know that. I mean, that's why you've never seen him on a horse. Okay, it's all right. Bicycles are fine with me. Um, Americans are egocentric versus um, sociocentric. And egocentric means I kind of know everything already. And it's very hard on teachers uh, when you get those kids in the classroom that really think. I can remember kids coming up to me, young people, and saying, you know, I could do what you do. I should just be behind your desk. And I'd say, yeah, but you have to get the ticket. You know, you have to get the degrees and you have to get the ticket. And they said, but why? I could do it. Why do I have to get the ticket? Why do I have to write a thesis? Why do I have to do any of this stuff? I could just do the job. Um, there is that egocentricity versus Japan, which is very socio-centric, uh, and therefore education has a whole different feeling. Um, we resist sharing with individuals who are different. Now, we're better at it than many, many cultures, but we have so many differences in the United States that there's kind of a feeling that we're not educating our own. And when we're anxious, those differences become more important. They become heightened. So there's a real desire. I want to educate my children and my friends' children, but I don't want to educate those children. And you, and it's not just that we think they might it'd be illegal, you know, uh, and they're, you know, shouldn't be in the United States. It it really hits almost every group that we've decided is different and therefore doesn't deserve it. All right. And now we don't even want to provide student loans, even though things are so much more expensive, because we don't want anyone to get an education without somehow suffering for it. Uh, and believe me, they are suffering. It was 100 times easier for me to work my way through college than it is for my young friends. It was cheaper. There wasn't such a split between what you could earn and what tuition was, because um, I did work my way through college. Um, Puritan ethic is really asserting itself which is that, you know, we don't need to help you. You do it on your own. Um, I think there's a real conflict um, that I never thought we'd see between religion and education. And you've heard it a hundred times, maybe less at community colleges, but the message is that you send kids to college, they'll lose their religion. And they'll lose their family and cultural belief systems. My mother said college ruined my brother and I. She was deeply religious. My aunt is a Benedictine, or was, because she's gone now. Uh, and um, she said college ruins you, too. Because even though we both have, I think, strong spiritual connections, we, um, we became more secular. The mythology you know, didn't make sense. One of the problems that the Catholics 
made, and my wonderful Benedictine aunt used to tell me this, is they educated all the nuns. Now the nuns think the Vatican is stupid. <laughs> it's when the peasants learn to read, the kings look stupid. When you educate everybody, you change the power structure. So there's danger, actually, in education. And there are literally groups in the United States just as during slave times, when they did do not want certain populations in the United States to be educated. And I'm stunned at that. That just seems ridiculous. It seems medieval. Um, and education is a low priority um, in terms of many other things. Now, I'm sorry to have given you such a long answer, but I was going to talk about it later. So uh, you asked, and, and I leaped into it. Um, I can only tell you you've got an uphill battle, battle as educators for another 10 years and then it will turn in your favor. We've done this a hundred times, waves of valuing education and defining it broadly, and then waves of defining it narrowly and not valuing it. And we're, up, we're past the worst. We're on the way up because it's becoming so clear that we cannot compete internationally uh, with the level of education. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Exxon, but those ads, if you've seen them, talking about our math scores worldwide, that's a real favor. And slowly that will sink in. So we're on the way up, but I think it's about a 10-year span before you'll be able to say, they're supporting education in California again. And it's a, been a 30-year cycle. Yes? So we're, we're very aware here that, and everywhere else about, the, speaking of math scores, that Math seems to be a, a tremendous barrier, yes. and we are seeing, you know, droves of students who, from a very, very young age, are turned off to math, fear it, you know, can't go there. And, and on the other side, you have math educators who are, you know, also flummoxed. So speaking of the tension, that, that must, you know, Well, what, you know, what's happening with math is, of course, in a technological world, it's tremendously important. But we've always thought of it as a specialty once you get past multiplication, you know, and, and uh, simple math. And we've thought, okay, Asians are better at math, right? Okay, let them do the math. And if you know what happens at a school like Stanford, you know, <laughs> two thirds of the students are, are Asian. Um, uh, or we say that women are afraid of math. And uh, certainly when we went to school, there were those messages. Or uh, my husband, as I said, is tutoring our 17-year-old grandson, and the math is just almost beyond him, and he was a brilliant scientist. So he has to study a week ahead so that when he sees Tyler, <laughs> he can keep up with him. Um, uh, I think what happened is we didn't care about math education for a period of time as we didn't care about science education, and it grew and expanded at such a rate that even our teachers are catching up. At the same time, we weren't supporting education. So I think we have to put a whole lot into math education so we have teachers who can teach it. And what we do about student phobia and student fear is we tell a new story. And the new story is the one we used to tell about language or the one we tell about literacy, which is even if it's hard, you have to do this if you want to be successful. You know? But it's a tough one. Uh, women are getting over it um, faster than one would have expected, so that's good news. Yes? I'm wondering in this uh, cycle of support for education over the decades, and maybe another 10-year cycle, which will be too late for me, but um, how the current um, call for accountability, the debilitating call for accountability in education at all levels, combined with the economic stresses, how does that fit into this, or is okay, that a result question. of the under? Okay, uh, let's. We've got this word accountability, and I could run, do it on the board, but there just aren't that many people in the room. Okay, we've got this word accountability. When people do not understand intelligence, skill, aptitude, you know, command, when they do not understand what literally creates understanding. Uh, uh, what consists, what an education is, they start talking about accountability. When they don't understand what we need to know, they start trying to measure something. And so uh, we start out with the Texas miracle, which you know George W. Bush in, uh, touted, and in fact, 
it turns out that when you teach to a specific test, you can get higher scores on the test. But those Texas kids, if they took any other test, did worse than almost anyone else in the country. So that was a total failure. That was a game. But it was bought. And so testing, when you do not understand what education is about, you test. And I think some tests are fine. Some tests are good. I believe in measurement. But we have gotten to the point where anything that can't be tested, we've decided is an education. So there's a big fight now over art and music and drama and all those things that kept kids in school. Your dropout rate in California is astounding in high school. It's astounding. It's as high as 50% in um, uh, some areas of California. I mean, 50% of your kids aren't finishing high school. And this used to be the number one state in the country for education. That's what I meant by it's been a 30-year cycle. Um, so it is a, this accountability just going along with the cycle, and you're already seeing it fall by the wayside. It's tremendously important that we have excellent teachers. So there's going to be all sorts of pushes, whether it's teacher training or letting teachers go or bringing people in laterally from other areas um, to teach. Uh, there's going to be tremendous pressure on public education to have higher, higher levels. You're going to lose tenure. It's got to go. Uh, there are already two states that essentially uh, community college and university people have lost tenure. There is an, a huge number of schools. That's Washington and um, Minnesota. I'm not Washington, but Oregon and Minnesota. There are going to be increasing numbers of um, uh, education systems, K through 12, without any kind of tenure. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of, of price paid, but hopefully in the, in the right direction. And the reward for that will be the recognition of what education is, what a good teacher is. There's also the use of technology to bring in master teachers. Because one of the things that we do know is you can be the best person in the world and maybe you're just not that great a teacher. And there are master teachers. They make movies about them, stand and deliver or whatever. And they walk in and all of a sudden kids want to learn what trigonometry or, you know, I mean, with technology we can bring them into any classroom in the country. So one of the ways to save money is to bring these master teachers lower and lower, not just university level, not just community college level, but to bring them into high schools. Whiteboards, as you know, that are really basically computer screens and that bring these master teachers in. The other thing, of course, is uh, all the learning that can be done by uh, pre-prepared you know, DVDs or whatever, because they're more exciting. Or we talked about Jack and the Beanstalk. You can learn chemistry up to a certain degree, the same way my little three-year-old grandson is doing Jack and the Beanstalk. They can just do it better, and they can make it more exciting. And the issue is, where is it better to have a teacher and where not? What is a teacher's role? And we're changing the role of many teachers. They're becoming coaches. They're becoming sort of team leaders. Um, they're becoming uh, uh, support systems. They're not actually presenting material. Now, if you love your material and you know it better than anyone else, then nobody can touch you as a teacher. But it's knowing the difference. And what is the balance? And technology can fill in the passion and the information and the data and the excitement where sometimes we can't. So you're going to see more and more and more of that mix. It ultimately saves money and raises the level of education. The problem is right now they don't want to give you money and they don't know what it is. And this new balance is literally being born and is evolving. Uh, they just announced, was it last week, uh, the availability of master teachers from some of the top universities uh, in the United States that they were going to be putting themselves online and that it was going to be free. They were creating a, a new system. And uh, one of the things my um, husband does is he down uh, buys these master classes. And he just puts the, them in the DVD. And I think, OK, uh, you know, I'm really not interested in this, because you know, he's interested in things like the Roman Empire or whatever. And I'll end up sitting there after dinner, and I'll just be captured. <laughs> and I'll be captured because this guy's from Harvard or Yale or Columbia or wherever, and he's so good uh, that you just want to stay and learn. And you can feel your brain cells zigging and your body getting excited. So if that's available, and our job is to facilitate, then I think that's a fine job. 
for a teacher. But it means giving up power, giving up control, giving up the ability to prance. And that's hard, depending upon what's in your, um, in your gut. How about one more question before we... Um, did I ever answer your question? Mine? Yes. Yes, of course, I have another one. Oh, okay, you, you can be the last one. Nobody else raised their hand, because they do want me to get to the rest so they can get out of here, so go ahead. Oh, um, so it, California invested in education back when we had the Race for Space. It was a fabulous story, very yes. action-oriented. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so we need a new story. Can we figure yes. out a new story? Well, <laughs> the question is we need a new story, because California had a story. Uh, first of all, historically, and you can trace this in the United States, we go through waves of greed and compassion, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, in high greed phases, and we're just coming off of one, we don't have much compassion. We think the reason that they don't have what they have is because, you know, they're either bad people or they're lazy or whatever. So right now, you really have, and I'll just go ahead and say it, the Mitt Romney theory of, of the world, which is I'm here because I'm better. And the reason I have bazillions isn't because my father had millions. It's, you know, Donald Trump, I'm here because I'm fabulous, not the fact that his father gave him the millions <laughs> that he has, right? So high greed phases uh, um, are phases where an elite decides that they're better because they have the money. And high greed phases um, always collapse, but they're very interesting. They're what the um, Buddhists call the hungry ghost phase meaning no amount of money satisfies that kind of greed. Hungry ghost. I'm empty, empty, empty. I need seven houses or 12 houses because I really can't philosophically move beyond just acquiring stuff. And once I've acquired and filled a house, then I'm a little bit bored, so I need to get another house and acquire it and fill it. And another and acquire it and fill it. Um, so high greed phases bring out people who just can't get off stage. I think of Jack Welch. So, you know, after running and doing a great job with the GE, Jack Welch just can't bear to get off the stage, so he makes them give him all sorts of things that he's leaving. He's already got bazillions of dollars, but now he wants tickets to the basketball games or to lifetime toilet paper. I mean, just ridiculous things that, that means he never has to, you know, shop. And then he wants a TV show. And then he dumps, I think, wife number three because he wants a new young wife. I mean, that's fine. Demi Moore did it right. Um, the point I'm trying to make is these high greed phases are extremely empty after a while. Hugh Hefner is a perfect example of it, a hungry ghost, okay? And so is Jack Welch, and so is Blank Fiend, and so is Donald Trump, and people who cannot get off the stage and who are never full. Well, High greed phases do themselves in, and then we start into a high uh, uh, compassion phase. And a high compassion phase is when you start, you know, it's like new age philosophy. You start loving everyone and thinking about yourself, and who am I, and who are you, and are we fulfilled, and don't we want the simple life? So magazines are coming out called The Simple Life, and we all want to compost with worms, and we want to, you know, donate to the food bank. I mean, and then after a while, we say, you know, we've done all this for them. We filled the food banks, we composted with the worms, and they're not grateful enough. <laughs> the high compassion phase has to be fed as well. And they just say, oh, I'm tired of these people. You know, I did all this. I helped them buy a house. You know, we changed our economic thing so they could get a mortgage, and they don't mow their lawn. What kind of people are they? And we start up into a high greed phase. Um, we've done this over and over in American culture, and if you just do the last 50 years of American history, you will see this. So normally, high greed phases are phases where we're not supporting education. High compassion phases are where we're supporting education and everything else to the point we can't afford it, you know. We're definitely going to be um, more like Europe, Europeanization, because where stomachs are full. I was raised when people said, will I have enough to eat today? Sorry, it's like, you know, walking to school or something. Um, now people, the constant question is, will I eat too much today? That's a complete reversal in 50 years. It's absolutely extraordinary. Well, the next question that comes once you have a full stomach is quality of life. And Europeanization is all about quality of life. Now, they've overdone it. 
right? <laughs> Got all kinds of problems. I mean, in Greece, nobody pays taxes, so eventually that quality of life is in jeopardy. But quality of life is a shorter work week. It's cradle to grave health care. It's it's a cradle to grave uh, free education. It's um, six weeks off or eight weeks off a year. It's uh, uh, you know wonderful food and wonderful wine and bikinis and nice purses. I mean, it's <laughs> it's quality of life, early retirement. And a Homo sapiens wants that up to a point. Everything I'm talking about is balance. Uh, Europeanization, though, is our future with modifications and with more balance because people in this next generation, you know them, the net generation, the 5 to 25 year olds, they think it's ridiculous to work yourself to death and not have time with your children and not have time for your community and not essentially have quality of life. Now, our, my kids are, you know, in their 40s and they're doing a much better job at parenting and they're a much better job at stress and quality of life than my generation did. And you're going to see that continue. So when we talk briefly about the future, one of the things you're going to see is that we are going to go that direction. And that requires very high levels of education. And if I can toss one last thing in, it's important to understand that one of the ways we change stories is traumatic events. 9-11 was a classic traumatic event, but it changed the story in the wrong direction. But World War II was this enormously traumatic event for all of Europe, winners and losers. Every country in Europe lost. They lost from every group. They lost from every generation. It was devastating. So what happened in Europe after World War II? A decision, a collective decision was made. We're not going to have any more wars. This was after war, after war, after war. They actually said, we don't want to dominate anymore. It's over. We're done. What we want is to take care of our communities. And that's where all that socialism came in. That's where all of that stuff I've just described came in. They literally said, we are done with domination. And so the European Union was born. I realize there are problems. Um, uh, kids in Europe frequently don't describe themselves by their country. They describe themselves as Europeans. There became all sorts of mixing, and the most profound thing, besides having the same money, except that the flip side of the coin might have an icon from one country or another country, was uh, about 10, 12 years ago, German honor students and French honor students got together and they demanded of their governments a new textbook in their senior history class. And they said, we want a textbook that could be shared by German and French seniors. Can you believe that? So five German scholars and five French scholars got together, wrote this history book, and it was, uh, began being used 10 years uh, ago. Now, what a profound thing. When have two countries that have fought so much been able to use the same history book? You had to tell the truth. <laughs> It was an extraordinary moment. Now, I, when this was happening, I was talking to a Canadian education group, and I said, we, we're both in North America. We ought to write a history book together. And then, <laughs> they just backed up. <laughs> and this one man raised his hand, and he said, you know, living next to the United States is like living next to a motorcycle gang. <laughs> <laughs> but if we had to tell the truth about our history, even just the last 50 years, you would be astounded. The history books that we give to our kids in high school are just full of lies. And I'm not talking about like exaggerations or slight reinterpretations. <laughs> They're just not true. Lots of them are, but lots of it is not. And that's what all countries do that. It's not just us. Uh, so again, you see the direction that, uh, that we're moving in. All right, let me quickly show you how we change, where we're going so that you don't give up on that. Um, I want you to pretend that this is a puzzle. It could also be a circle, but um, I have put, you're sitting at your kitchen table or your study desk and I have thrown in front of you a 5,000 piece puzzle. Okay, data, lots and lots of data. And there's no picture, there's no box, all right? Now, if it was an actual puzzle, what's the first thing you try to do? You try to get the edges, all right? 
Now, all an anthropologist like me can do is offer you the edges, okay? You're going to have to fill in the data. I'll give you some. But we know what the frame is, what the context is for adaptation of Homo sapiens over time. Number one is tech. A technological breakthrough. Progress is the concentration of energy. The difference between a steam engine and a microchip. Progress is the concentration of energy. Now, speaking of concentration of energy, we have two choices. One is to keep going and quit early. All right? The other is to take a break so you can stretch and run away. But you have the freedom to do that. Who would like to just keep going? I mean, because I, I don't want to be make my own choices. I want you to have that. Who would like to just keep going and quit early? Um, and who would love a chance to go to the bathroom or take a break? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. When I finish this section, uh, we'll take a break. Okay? So I can do it um, the first part real fast. All right. So technology. When you get a concentration of energy, it doesn't matter if it's the domestication of animals or, you know, urban industry and assembly lines. It, you can see all the sequences. You change everything. You change what we consider intelligence to some degree, because some stays the same. You change the aptitude. You change personality. That's why I tease that the nerds will inherit the earth. We're having trouble in Seattle, which is nerd central, getting kids to turn out for football. Why mm -hmm. wouldn't they turn out for football? Well, they don't want concussions because they're going to need their brains to work for, you know, Google or Microsoft. Um, and as one kid summed it up, he said, look, he said, you can't put enough padding on me to protect me from concussion, and you can't take enough clothing off the cheerleader to make it relevant because I have the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> the old motivation, football is a hunting and gathering ritual. It's a bunch of guys chasing a pig. If they catch the pig, they get the fertile female. Once those elements of the story change, the games change. And you're seeing real shifts in what kinds of games, many of them individual sports, that young people are um, attracted to. So technology changes everything, and it even changes our definition of character. Um, the next corner is economics. And economics is nothing more than the uh, uh, rational use of the energy released, the efficient use of the energy released by the technological breakthrough. So you go to urban industry, right? Because you can produce things in a different way than in agriculture. Um, microchips, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's amazing how cheap things are. Uh, it's, in fact, it's stunning to me how cheap things are now and how uh, what we consider to be subsistence level in the United States includes a whole range mm -hmm. of things that never would have been there in the 1950s. I mean, like in some places, toilets, but certainly television and you know, all the rest of it, microwaves. So technology, uh, you get an energy breakthrough, economics, efficient use of that energy. We've already done demographics. And what I mean by demographics is who do we allow to participate in the new economy? So if the technological breakthrough is a single stroke engine or a steam engine, um, or a forklift truck, and you're eliminating the strength differential, then you're letting all those women move boxes. When you change the strength uh, differential, you have, you've changed everything. Women could arm wrestle men so they were blue in the face and probably never win. I have tried. Okay? But on a forklift truck, right, or with a gun, <laughs> there's a certain amount of equality um, that develops. Then you add contraception, right, and if you're not barefoot and pregnant, you can teach. Do you have any idea why they're trying to end contraception in the United States? I'm not talking about abortion. They are trying to end contraception. Now, some of it could be a deeply held belief in whatever. I don't want to question people's deeply held religious beliefs. But a significant amount is a power play. Why? 
Because one of the most painful things that has happened since the 1950s is the loss of control over conception. It used to be that women got married, women got pregnant. Women had sex, they got pregnant. We were scared that you know it could sneak across a car seat even if you were fully clothed. I mean, we were panic stricken in my high school because if you got pregnant, boy, your life was over. They kicked you out of pep club for sure. Um, it was, well, there was never a pregnant girl in my high school, if you need to understand. It's a very different world now. Um, but once women got contraception, women could choose. Not that they always did, and we all know about that, but the point is, is who was then making the choices about whether they had a child or not? And you could conceal that you were using contraception if you were taking the pill. Well, if I was a man, I would be furious at the loss of control of something so fundamental as whether I could have a baby or not. And then they went even further. Because of the courts, they could have a baby with you and then take the baby away from you. Thank God the courts have become more reasonable. And the courts understand that men are just as capable of being good parents to infants as women are. Um, but please understand that behind a lot of this contraception stuff is this attempt to redress the power imbalance that has shifted so dramatically. We don't have, nobody talks about these things, right? <laughs> we talk about these things. All right. Um, anyway, demography, we did that entire. Um, 110 year um, uh, history uh, to give you an idea. Uh, I know demography is supposed to be how many you have of something, but to me it's, it's whether you have any power. Whether a group is considered to be a citizen and therefore have power. And the last thing, we've only barely touched on this, culture. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about when you get back. We're going to talk about the sorting mechanisms. What are the four elements that sort all these puzzle pieces into something recognizable, all right? Because you can look at these four trends and know. And then we're going to talk about culture, the cultural tapestry that makes it so difficult to commit to the obvious, even as, as educated as many of you are. We we'll all get caught in this. And um, if we can transcend it, what happens is your students feel it, and it changes the, your classroom. Okay, so um, let's just take a short break, just enough for you to get coffee or go to the bathroom, whatever you want to do. Because the sooner you come back, the sooner we can finish and quit. <laughs> uh, what I promised you is that we would do a quick. See, I think it's just that the board is tired. I was like, brought me new ones, and I'm pressing really hard. Let me try the red one. Um, this is fun for me, right? But if I had a screen or a telestrator, it doesn't really matter. What I wanted to do was, before we tackle culture, is give you some trends, and I won't spend much time on it. And by the way, if any of you want to email me with a question, that's one of the things I offer every time I do something like this, is you can have a year to ask questions. So, you can have more than that. All right, so it's my initials, JJ at jenniferjames.com. And please feel free because if I have something that works for you, I'm happy. Okay, so if we're looking in our puzzle of all this data that comes to you constantly, just inundates you, how do you sort it? Because one of the things that creates a tremendous amount of anxiety is not being able to sort it. Because then you can't predict the future. You can't even handle the present. You just want to go home and turn on a TV and zonk, which I do on a regular basis. Okay. Or hope that, you know, <laughs> Rachel Maddow will sort it out, right? <laughs> yes. You're uh, still away. So here are some sorting mechanisms. One trend, increasing complexity. Every time you figure out the technology, it's just going to get more complex. The good news, you'll get better and better at handling it because the more complexity often means the simpler to operate. So I now have a car with a navigation system. I love it. I don't get lost. It's a whole new thing. It's just fabulous. But I would have told you, you know, who needs that? All right? I'm not sure about telephones that, you know, take photos and shower you and write. 
do all your shopping, and you now can show as you get on an airplane. I mean, I, but that's my uh, Neanderthalness. Um, think of uh, uh, cars, of course, uh, they're like airplane cockpits now, but they're easier to drive and they start. When I grew up, cars didn't start. You, as a girl, you didn't go out on a date if you didn't know how to pop a clutch and, and push a car. I mean, okay. Uh, defibrillators. You can have a home defibrillator, it costs about $250. So you have it in the kitchen cupboard and you're having a big July 4th party and grandpa goes down. Who's the best person after someone's calling 911? Who's the best person to handle a defibrillator? Teenage boy. Exactly. A 10 year old, actually. Why? Because they have uh, all sorts of confidence. They've been watching way too many medical emergency shows, and it's voice activated. So they run and get the defibrillator, they put it on Grandpa, and, and it tells them exactly what to do. Boom! Grandpa's up for dessert, right? <laughs> In other words, the confidence level of the young people can easily handle this technology. It's much harder the older you are because you're, it's not second nature. It's not just sort of built into your system, so you have to stretch yourself. But I remember when computers first came in, believe it or not, that's, I was alive then, and I used a cookie timer, a kitchen timer, uh, to control my anxiety. 15 minute intervals teaching myself. And of course, that's when the programs failed all the time. Do you remember that? You'd think it was you, and it was the GD program. That <laughs> wasn't had a glitch in it. All right. Um, the next thing is increasing sophistication. Now, what do I mean by that? It used to mean the clothes you wore, right? Or your, you know, I've forgotten the name of the guy that makes all the high heels. But anyway, come, uh, sophistication was, you know, avocado appliances in the 60s. Uh, and now, sophistication has been completely redefined. Sophistication is really your ability to manage your life. Your ability to take responsibility. Um, your ability to communicate. Your ability to negotiate. In most parts of the country, people don't care about clothing. They'd like you to be covered. I do wish we could get back to that. But, <laughs> well, you know, you get on an airplane. I'm sorry, but, you know, some 17-year-old gets on, you know, with a halter top and short shorts and thongs uh, and sort of bulging out all over. Um, I, my sense is at least maybe a slightly more fabric. Right? <laughs> okay. We old ladies are here. <laughs> right. um, anyway, but... Um, now, you may pay more for your clothes, but people are pretty much dressing alike. And the difference between what Bill Gates wears and what somebody driving a truck wears is really very little. They're probably both in khakis and shirts or t-shirts. And in the old days, you know, the Whited Kings wear all those robes and all that brocade and, you know, the crowns and it would take forever to get, you know, Victoria dressed. It was to show the power, the difference, the separation from the peasant who was wearing sackcloth. Now, we actually react against that. And men report to you know, men's magazines that when they see a woman dressed to the nines, they don't want to go out with her. Because they can see how long it would take for her to get that together, and they can see their life just dwindling away. <laughs> and the only place that you can actually see on a regular basis people dressed like that is in West Palm Beach and in New York. I know there's a few other places, but what I'm trying to say is the separation by clothing and the indication of sophistication of power by clothing has changed dramatically. Sophistication is much more to do with your person and, uh, and how you live your life and how you balance your life. Uh, and it, of course, is what's essential uh, if you're going to be a good worker or a good teacher. So increasing complexity, increasing sophistication. Um, the, uh, another element of increasing sophistication is rapid bonding. The ability to meet someone and very quickly form a relationship. Because corporations, you know, you don't get 10 years to form a relationship anymore. They want you to hit the ground and within, you know, a couple of hours be working on a team or connecting with clients. Um, increasing effectiveness. And what I mean by effectiveness is that uh, you have to do more with less. That's clear. Life is so complex. You guys are juggling so much that essentially you're just doing a whole lot more. Imagine how much was coming into your head driving or riding around your farm in 1900 versus just driving to work now. 
It's huge. So energy, one of the things, the young man that picked me up, Stephen, just brought me from my hotel. The minute I met him, I got this energy infusion. Some people walk into the room and the energy level goes up. And other people walk into the room and the energy level goes down. People are desperate for energy. Desperate. They're anxious. They're tired. They're overloaded. Anybody that has that energy in whatever form becomes more valuable. But in order to offer that energy, we've really had to change who we are. And I already mentioned it. We change how we parent. Because all sorts of things that my parents could do turn kids off today. What do you mean? They'll report you is what they'll do. We've changed the way we coach. What do coaches do now? They can't dominate. They have to give energy. They have to build goals and team and self-esteem. <laughs> I mean, it's a whole different kind of coaching. Maybe they're sandwiching it with, you know, that toughness. But I've seen the movies. What was that movie where Sandra Bullock helps that African-American guy become a football player? I mean, it's such a lovely movie. Blindside. The blind side. Yes, The Blind Side. I mean, it's a very different thing that's going on in, in um, how we're handling those kinds of uh, relationships. Uh, so increasing effectiveness is increasing ability to manage people. And managing people takes a very different skill set than it used to. You, we used to say, leave your brains at home, we have a manual. All right? In other words, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, I'll order you around, and when I need you to know something, I'll tell you. Now we're desperate because people keep leaving their brains at home. We need sophisticated workers who can do A and figure B and C out without being told, and most workplaces are giving up on manuals because nobody reads them and they got too big. Places like Nordstrom gives you one page, right? It's just kind of an overall philosophy. And they want a certain level of effectiveness that's built into uh, your personality. Um, the rest, uh, uh, perhaps increasing demands for justice, would be maybe the last one I talk about. For the first time in history, people know where the stuff is, and it has dramatically changed the world. People know where the stuff is. For most of the previous history, people didn't know where the stuff was. On the farm, outside of Spokane, I didn't know there were rich people in Spokane. I did not know that people had two bathrooms. Uh, I was thrilled we had one, because uh, we didn't in the beginning. Uh, people uh, who had like, more than one car, or, or people that had estates, I mean, they were like the kings and queens in history, but not real people. Now. Everybody knows where everything is. And what it has led to is mass migration. The most destabilizing thing in the world today is mass migration. Why? Because they hear either the rumor of a great place, or they know where the stuff is. So I'm going to give you the migration test. You are all 18 years of age, and just as smart and as energetic as when you were 18, but you're in Zimbabwe and you're starving, okay? You love your country, you love your family, you love your landscape, it's deep inside you, but you're hungry, and you hear a rumor of a great place. And you actually see a magazine, or you talk to someone, or somehow you know where the stuff is. How many of you would do everything you could to figure out how to get out of there? That's what mass migration is. People are not coming over American borders just to upset you, which is what so many people think. <laughs> They're coming over American borders because of what their opportunities are where they are. I'm not a fan, by the way, of the illegal migration. I'm not talking about that. But it doesn't matter whether you're in the Turkish countryside or whether you're in Zimbabwe. What we're seeing around the world is the minute the knowledge of where the resources are, where the stuff is, it changes everything. And that knowledge has only come about in the last 20 years. Uh, there's always been some of this, but it's huge now, and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, this leads to a major trend, which is demand for justice. And demand for justice is, you know, more income equality, more access to health care, more access to education, more fairness in the world. And that means that if someone has too much of the stuff, as defined by who knows who, they're going to have to give some of it up. 
That is so hard to do. Remember my talking about if you've got power, it's much harder to give up power than it is to acquire power. It's the same with stuff. Giving up stuff, you might tell yourself, I want a simple life, but I'd like to choose how I do my simple life. <laughs> when other people are pushing you and you're going to have less stuff so that they can have more, it creates a tremendous tension. And that's what's going on in the world today. So high unemployment in the United States because what Chinese people are willing to work for a dollar an hour is creating a tremendous amount of tension. Now hopefully this will begin to equalize. But let's just say you're all wonderful, decent human beings, social workers at heart because you're teachers. And here's your option. You're going to have one less room in your house and a Chinese person is going to be able to now what is your choice? Let's make it fair. A thousand Chinese people are going to be able to eat one meal every day, but you're going to have a smaller closet. I have to tell you, it's not an easy decision. You don't know those thousand people, and isn't it their own fault? So I'm not trying to talk any of you into social work. I'm trying to say that the dynamics in the world right now are an increasing demand for justice whether it is Egypt and the revolution, or it is this uh, e economic uh, transport where you can now make a car anywhere in the world and then have it turn up at your doorstep. It's an extraordinary shift in how we use the world's resources. Okay, so let's dash the culture and then we'll talk about what's happening as individuals. So if you wanna know where we're going and how we're getting there, watch the technological breakthrough anticipate the economic shift that will go through the, con uh, the breakthrough once there's a concentration of energy. Anticipate and prepare for the fact that a new group of citizens will be drawn into the use of this energy because it will be efficient, just as we've drawn women into the workforce and pretty much everybody else. And that the hardest thing, we're real good at the technology, we're a shift to the economy, we're pretty open in the United States about accepting different people. But we're having a terrible time, a huge time lag, accepting a new story. A belief system that lets us use the technology, adjust to the economic system, and accept the demographic shift. When you tell me there's a single teacher here that is uncomfortable with technology, I can understand it. It doesn't make any sense because it's 2012, it's not like you know, 1990. So what we have here is the difficulty of changing the cultural tapestry. So I want to spend a minute on that and then we'll go to a few more questions and then we'll wrap up with the individual. All right. Culture, I want you to imagine just this beautiful tapestry, ceiling to floor, this rich, beautiful woven tapestry and it has everything in it that makes you an American whether you're an American with a hyphen or whatever. Welsh American, how boring, right? My Yugoslav sister-in-law said, Jennifer, you have no ethnicity. <laughs> what can I say is true? <laughs> I have brown eyes, you know, I have something. But, all right. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, this tapestry has all the foods that are perfect, you know, all the symbols, the music, the, the everything that makes you American. I already talked about cowboys, but I do graduations and they play the battle hymn of the Republic and I can't help but cry. Now it's a dumb song. It has terrible words. They're all blood, guts, and whatever. But I heard it as a young child and it just is so powerful. So here I am as we speak at the graduation and the tears are running down my face because that music goes through. I was widowed at 59 and uh, my son thought I'd just give up and become granny and behave myself. And I tried for a while, but I got very long, really long. So I went out on a thing called Science Connection. I have wonderful girlfriends, but still. I went out on a thing called Science Connection because I thought at least I'd meet people I could talk to. It'd be okay. And I discovered something that in my age group, they didn't let women get PhDs and MDs. It was 10 to 1 man. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I was hot. 
<laughs> I had mathematicians coming up from Portland, Oregon, geneticists coming down from Vancouver, you see. I was just dating up a storm. My son came over and gave me the sex talk. <laughs> I wasn't doing any of that sort of thing yet, but he was so worried. He went, oh my God, this is my oldest uh, child. I'm, you know, I'm close to all of them, but he just is... Um, someone who feels he can talk to mother about certain kinds of things. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, I uh, uh, would have to go on coffee dates. That's how you meet them. You know, you're all supposed to meet them at a coffee house so they can't, you know, rape you. But they were all just lovely scientists. <laughs> and I, but I didn't know how to do it. So what was in my cultural tapestry at 59 and 60 that would let me do this again? Rock and roll. So I would just put in a CD in my car as I'm driving the coffee date at Buddy Hawk, right? Or Elvis Presley, you see how old they are? And I'd be 17 again. By the time I get to the coffee house, I knew how to date. It was absolutely wonderful. Until lucky me, about two years later, I met this wonderful molecular biologist. And um, we married three years ago. Um, and it's all turned out well. But why am I telling you this story? Because this tapestry, that's what it's made of. It's made of your music. It's made of your food. It's made of your stories. And many of them are shared as a country. Now what happens when someone starts tearing up your culture? It's one thing if they're going to make you, remember real many quiche? It's one thing if they want to change your diet. Okay, and fine, the music always changes and other things change. But what if they're tearing your culture up so fast that all of a sudden you lose faith that it can hang together? That's what's been happening by our moving so fast. We don't recognize our own country. We think our tapestry has been shredded. And if there's no visionary leaders that shows you the new tapestry, shows you the future that you can kind of believe then you think you're going to hell in a handbasket. What's very interesting in cultural shifts is when there is a void, and in major cultural shifts, there's always a void. The enlightenment, whichever one you want to take. And these voids between the beginning of tearing parts of the old cultural tapestry and not seeing the new one being revoked, these voids are always moral voids. They feel like moral voids, which is why you have all these preachers going out there and saying all of these things. Some of them, you know, sound like they're from 100 years ago. Because it feels like there's a void in American culture and that it's a moral void and that it has to be addressed. And the only way we really know how to address it simply is with religious uh, stories or icons. Uh, it's a much more complex philosophical thing if you're going to address it from a secular point of view. So without a visionary leader, let me give you a quick example of how you can tear a tapestry and survive if you have a visionary leader. Let's take Nelson Mandela, one of the most culturally intelligent individuals the world has ever produced. In the midst of apartheid, what should have been a bloodbath, this brilliant man, while he's in prison, has studied Afrikaner culture. So I wish I had time. There's so many examples of how he protected the Afrikaners. He didn't really change the national anthem, he just added a few words. He cheered on the soccer team even when it was all white. I mean, he was so smart about what parts of the tapestry you play with and tear and what you don't. But the most important thing he did is he told a compelling story of reconciliation. He drew them a new tapestry. He said, we can reweave this. A compelling story of reconciliation. When we're changing the speed of light, we get stuck on the cultural shift, the last corner of the frame, of the context, if we don't have a new story. And what's so interesting is that the very same time in history that Mandela is doing this, you have Milosevic showing you the opposite, telling a 13th century story of revenge, and you get a bloodbath. Up to a quarter of a million people die in the Bosnian conflict. A 13th century story. So every day you pick up your paper and you're reading about countries in conflict, which ones are telling stories of the future? A reweaving of the tapestry, <coughs> reconciliation, and which ones are telling the story of the past? Revenge. It's ours. God wants us to have it. 
and you'll get a clue. Because even if you get it for a while, you'll lose it. Because you cannot sustain these old tapestries, they fall apart. So if I sum up this entire process, one of my favorite examples is the Civil War. I can do it in 10 seconds. The Civil War was a battle over technology. Increasingly industrial north fighting an agrarian south. The battle over economy, economics, who's a worker? A battle over demographics, who's a human being? And a battle over culture, what does it mean to be a nation? And 500,000 people died to reweave the tapestry that you're living in now. We don't see these processes. And we luckily are not going to kill 500,000 people. Not in our country. We killed uh, who knows how many in Iraq. Um, I'm not against war. I think sometimes war is the only choice. I'm just against truly stupid wars that accomplish nothing other than we get to have the excitement of that first two or three nights with wolf boots or saying, oh, it's like the 4th of July, watching the bombs go off in Baghdad. It's just a crazy thing in America's stomach. Europeans didn't feel that at all. Europeans were sick because they know about war. Mm. But we don't know about war. And so that's why it's easy for us. But anyway, mm. that's hopefully not too good. Um, so anyway. Um, what we're lacking right now, we don't have a Nelson Mandela to give us a clear vision. So we're going to fight about the tearing of this tapestry. Um, we're going to sit in this moral void. We're going to fight about being honest brokers uh, of information and education, um, as I said, for another 10 years. So how can I help you through this? And I want to offer you a couple of things. One is I have a, a whole thing I've done on the net generation. Um, the 5 to 25 year olds, I've got this handy dandy chart on 65 plus. That's the silent generation, except for people like me. Um, the boomers, um, Gen X, the net generation, and, and how they operate. These are gross generalizations on all sorts of things. In other words, how they learn, what they see as rewards, what their work ethic is, relationships, community. Um, one of my favorites is gender. Uh, the silent generation liked tough guys and stoic women, okay? The boomers were confused men and women, right? Everything was changing. Gen X liked cool men and skinny women. <laughs> so what does the net generation like? They like tough girls and sensitive guys with style. I mean, I'm just playing with this, but uh, just email me. And I'll send a copy to Mary Jo um, and the rest of the stuff that I've got on. Because you probably get a lot of kids in that age group, and um, we're not going to have time to talk about it. And that's perfect. I never have time to talk about it, so I finally did that. All right, let's now quickly talk about what's happening to you as individuals. Well, maybe I should. Are there any questions about this adaptation process I just did? I realize I'm racing ahead, intimidating. I don't mean to. Yes. No. Well, you just talked about uh, Milosevic and going back to the 13th century. How do you see then Egypt presently, where the rights of women are being curtailed again, yeah. where they use Egypt used to stand out? This is a, a perfect example. You've got a tapestry, and they've torn a bunch out of it, right? They've thrown out this leader, and they're trying to move, and they're scared to death. So what happens when you're scared to death? You just want control somewhere. And they, they're going to do it to women. And we see this happen over and over again, where women are held back. This was true in many of our best liberal movements, where you know we'd all say, yeah, we made it. And they'd say, no, but you stay home. Mm -hmm. um, the point is, it's short-lived. But it is a natural reaction to there's too much out of control, and what can I control? And frequently, it's women. How do you then see the future for, for is that too specific for Egypt and no, the women? No, because I've, I've, I've ten, year, ten years, ten years, I don't even think, it won't be a generation, it'll be far less. I think it could be far less than ten years, it could be five years. If Egypt stabilizes, if they get a somewhat democratic government, women will get right back to where they were and start moving ahead. Um, but if they don't, 
if the anxiety level goes up, if the government fails, then it'll take longer. Somebody is going to have to pay for the confusion. And it's almost always women. I have a dear friend, Amal Winter, and Amal is an Egyptian psychologist. And five years ago, she was just one of my closest friends in Seattle, and five years ago she went back to Cairo. Uh, her family are sort of elites back there, and she went back to Cairo to teach in the American University there because she could feel this revolution happening. And uh, she teaches only women because it's Egypt, and mostly women who are teachers and uh, who are coming back essentially for advanced degrees or advanced information. And um, Amal and I email all the time, and she just is devastated by the fact that they went so far and now they're trying to hold them back. Um, and so we have been emailing about this boomerang. This, this always happens, two steps forward and then a step back to stabilize. It gets too scary. And so unfortunately, it's not always women, but it's usually women that can be controlled, can be pushed back. Okay, anyone else? Let's do the um, um, individual, and um, all of you have had your Maslow. Everybody remember Abraham Maslow, the hierarchy of human development? Okay, think of yourself, and think of your students, and this is where the United States is. The bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy was survival, okay? So if you're just trying to eat, you really are not thinking about quality of life, and, you know, diversity and, you know, expanding democracy, you're really just thinking about how to survive. And there's quite a few people like that in the United States, more than there used to be. And when you're at a survival level, you really don't feel open and you don't feel compassionate. It's when you tend to go backwards to what once worked. Keep the powder dry, uh, you know, keep the mice out of the flower, keep the fortress tight and get a whole bunch of guns. I mean, it's just the Wild West. The gun thing is such a wonderful symbolic thing. They're having a big fight in Tampa, Florida, because the mayor of Tampa doesn't think they should be allowed to take guns into the hall during the Republican convention. Well, I don't know how I feel about that, <laughs> but hey, I'm joking. <laughs> Governor Scott, you know, says you have to let them have guns. What could be worse? But anyway, the only problem would be if Democrats had guns that went into the hall in Tampa. All right. Um, we're in a world um, where we have shifted so dramatically from fate to choice, whether it's whether you get married or whether you have children or where you work or how you die, um, that Maslow's hierarchy is moving extremely fast. So the next level up in Maslow's hierarchy is security. Once your stomach is full and you feel sort of safe, you want to hold on to it. You buy an insurance policy, right? You get savings and you get stuff. You go to Costco, you buy a gallon jug of mustard. <laughs> now you'll never use it, you'll have to leave it in your will. <laughs> but you feel so safe knowing you will never run out of mustard. And it's like those guys have with the seven houses. Or literally, people fill their closets with stuff. They have enough clothing for themselves and eight other people of varying sizes for the rest of their lives. Why? Because it's so hard to feel secure. I finally had to force myself about six or seven years ago to only, I've never been a big shopper, but I get the itch. So uh, to only go to a place called Value Village. And at Value Village I can buy an outfit for myself and for each of my grandchildren for about $12 with my senior discount, particularly on Tuesdays, okay? <laughs> it satisfies that hunting and gathering thing. I never go to Nordstrom. I'm sorry. I used to go to Nordstrom on a regular basis. And I don't, can't tell you when I last went to Nordstrom. I'm sorry about that in terms of you know, the market and all the rest of it. But I can be totally satisfied at Value Village. You know, they have designers. <laughs> right? I haven't seen anyone. Manolo, that's the guy that makes those shoes. <laughs> right. I can't wear those kind of shoes anymore. But, so, um, security. The problem with the security level, uh, we talked about hungry ghosts, is ever knowing you've gotten there. So you can have a huge house, it can be absolutely full of stuff, and you're still a hungry ghost. And right now, that's the philosophical mind that many, many Americans are in. 
They literally cannot find security regardless of how obviously secure they are. And so there's a lot of torturing that goes on. Um, the next level up is um, what he called self-actualization. You could call it self-knowledge. Uh, but it's where we really began to move in the 60s and 70s, which is my stomach is full. I feel reasonably safe. Now I can ask about quality of life. Who am I and who are you? All of a sudden, we wanted relationships where we were known and loved. Now, my father grunted his way through 40 years of marriage. What do you want, dear? <laughs> my father never talked. My father never had a conversation with me. The most intimate thing he did is when I was going off to college at 17, I was in the back seat of a car. And he came out of the house. We had a little small house on the farm. And he came out of the house and he knocked on the window of the car. So I rolled it down. And he handed me five dollars. He didn't say a word. That was the most intimate moment I ever had with my father. Now, I mean, I've got my three-year-old grandson and my uh, oldest son, they have these long conversations. I mean, they just all think it's so important to talk about everything. And look at what we do with our spouses or our partners, or our significant others. You know, tell me how you feel. If you go home and you're tired and your significant other says, I want to talk to you. I'd like to be closer. If you're not careful, you're going to have a rough night. Right? We want intimacy. We don't just want security. Self-knowledge has an upside, more quality of life, you know, more quality of relationships, more confidence, more who we are. It has a downside. And downside, it's called depersonalization. And this next, this generation we're looking at right now is caught in it. Depersonalization or narcissism. If you really have always had what you needed to eat and always had security and daddy or mommy gave you a car and you're really just fine, then you don't have to care about anybody or anything. And we have a huge amount of narcissism, whether you want to use Paris Hilton as the icon or you know any number of kids you know, um, who just have no sense of the real world and no sense of their place in it other than me and what I can put on my body and what I can do for me. The good news is narcissism, this deep personalization, is a normal phase. You get stuck when you're dealing with something as complex as self-knowledge and self-actualization. Did you have a question? Oh, I was just going to say, I, you know, with the first thing that comes to mind is Facebook. Yes. And the need to have 5,000 friends. Or, oh, you know, and this, wonderful friends on Facebook, yeah. You know, so, uh, or MySpace or any of them, yes. And they actually think they're friends. And the key is the number. Right, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've answered the question. So please understand that you're going to see a lot of this narcissism, this obliviousness, but it is a normal part of something as complex as r defining yourself as an individual, which we really didn't have permission to do until the last couple of generations. And we don't know how to do it. And we're having a lot of questions about values, and again, very little uh, leadership. So if we go up the, um, the last level, uh, sort of past this self-knowledge, self-respect, um, what, um, what was the next level up? There's two more. Is um, uh, Maslow didn't actually name these, but he said uh, uh, we would begin to transform we would begin to find enough comfort and balance in our, within ourselves, enough self-knowledge that we would extend it to community. Not because we had to to survive, as we once did in farming communities, uh, like the Grange Hall, but because it was the way we wanted to live. And that's what I see in my son's generation, the forming of friendships, the forming of helping each other in a, in a non-competitive way. And that this transformation uh, into more and more interest and concern in the community would eventually extend to the world. So it's kind of like a values hierarchy where you might start with the most m minimal kind of exchange and eventually get to quality of life for everyone everywhere. It all depends on how safe you feel and how full your stomach is, how much you're willing to extend out into the world. Uh, but the trajectory is clear. And that's what I wanted to offer you, is that even though we're going through a hard time, the future trends um, are all on our side. 
And the fact that we're doing it all at once is what is overwhelming us. And that's what the technology is doing. The technology is connecting us too rapidly for us to process. The technology is spewing data at it way beyond our ability to synthesize, sort, um, understand. Uh, the diversity in our community is multiplying it. Uh, it's harder in many ways in the United States than some other places because we have to both become more sophisticated while we may have less in terms of goods. Compare that to China, where more and more and more is going to be available. It's like the United States in the 50s, when everything was possible. And we were so optimistic. And it doesn't require a great deal of sophistication or complexity if you can just get a better job. All right? So they're following through the pattern that we've gone through. But our pattern is that the increasing quality of life for us is going to be internal. And that is a very, very difficult thing to process. It's something that Obama sometimes tries to talk about, but unsuccessfully. Um, and um, who knows when. But if you want to look around the world at communities and countries that do well with the level of technology we have now and increasing levels, here's what they have in common. They're homogenous. The Finns are pretty much all Finns. We don't have that. We're heterogeneous and we're just getting more so. There's no country in the world like this one. We're an absolutely wonderful mess. I call it creative chaos. And creative chaos is a very different thing to manage than a kind of sustained tenacity that you can find in a homogenous culture like Japan or Finland. Um, they're smaller. It's so much easier if it's small enough to kind of cope with. They respect their government and require collaboration and compromise. We have never been very good at collaboration and compromise. We've had our phases. We're great during wartime, you know, like World War II. Um, we were probably great during the Depression. Um, but we don't think we have to compromise. We think we can rule the world. And one of the scariest things that Mitt Romney came out with, I think about two weeks ago, was wanting America to dominate again. He wants to put two aircraft carriers off the coast of Iran. He wants to increase the uh, army by 100,000 men and women. Uh, it's just a pipe dream. It's just a different world. You cannot dominate anymore. It's just a total waste of money. Uh, it's just dysfunctional. This isn't a world built for physical domination like that. Um, too many people have the bomb. Um, so collaboration and compromise, which again is what you see in most of the cultures that we were listing out is, is high on that um, chart. Uh, they're deeply committed to education. Uh, they're also deeply committed to equality in opportunity and in income. They do not have these huge, we have the broadest income gap in the world, aside from probably Saudi Arabia. That there's, there's something seriously wrong. This is new. This is only over the last 20 years. And it's not just Bill Gates. Um, and they are concerned about the environment. Anyone been to France and ridden some of those amazing French trains? And what do you see as you ride a train through the French countryside? No billboards. But you see, I'm sorry. No, but you see so an incredible amount of graffiti. The graffiti is absolutely everywhere. Oh, oh in the cities, you're right. I see the graffiti. In the, no, yeah. but in the, just my whole trip from Paris to wherever I was going was all one big, huge well, How graffiti. interesting. Yeah, it was just awful. It was I, like, I, I rode the same train and all I saw was this amazing countryside with no billboards. <laughs> Don't you love, this is a very important thing. What she is saying, what you see, what you don't. Right. Um, uh, underground utilities, uh, the rapid transit, regardless of what's outside the window, it's humiliating for America to have the kind of airports we have and the kind of transport we have when you compare us to almost anywhere in the world. That, we all have to agree on, is absolutely um, stunning. Uh, in other words, uh, opportunity for everyone to get from here to there, with or without, you know, the billboards or the graffiti. Um, so what cultures normally do and what we will do is they create hybrids. 
This election, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but what I would guess is this election um, either has to be a decision for the future, and what the future requires is a kind of hybrid of the best of America and the best of Europe or wherever else. Because that's what Homo sapiens normally does. It tries to take the best of two things and create a hybridization and end up with a better thing. Uh, or it will be a throwback that we're just not finished with our American exceptionalism argument. We're just not finished with the power of stuff. And so we're determined to run through another cycle of it. Um, either way, I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter because the next cycle, either sooner or later, will clearly be this hybridization and this movement towards a, a more balanced uh, European kind of model where education <laughs> will again be uh, at the top and where it needs to be, which is why I talked to 10 years because it depends upon um, who gets elected. It doesn't really depend that as much on Obama and Romney as it does on, on who's running the House of Representatives and, and who owns the Senate, whether anything happens at all um, in one direction or another. And what I mean by a Europeanization is basically security in terms of health, in terms of education, and yes, in terms of workers. Uh, uh, constantly increasing skills and uh, increase, uh, constantly increasing um, uh, accuracy in, in understanding history and science and economics uh, and better government. Those are the elements that I think of when I think of um, Europeanization. So, how can I help you? Accept ambivalence. We're in the middle of an incredibly adaptive time in history, but particularly in American history. And there are, ambivalence is the way it is. And it takes a lot of intelligence to accept ambivalence. It's easy to accept this is the way it is. I'm right, and I can tell you I'm right. And you should all have guns, and if everyone in this room had guns, then no one could shoot us up. And I'm so committed to that, and I'm you know totally against contraception or whatever it is, or you know everybody should be able to marry everybody, including their horses or whatever. Uh, in other words, if you can take a very simplistic approach, it's reassuring. It reduces anxiety. You don't have to think about it. Ambivalence requires you to say, it could be this or it could be that. We need to learn more, or maybe we'll try this and maybe it won't work. Ambivalence is it's not reassuring. One of the reasons that liberals don't do as well in their messaging is they're so ambivalent. They're so complex. They want you to understand. Lakoff wrote this wonderful book where he pointed out that the authoritarianism in conservatives was much more successful because they could just order you about. It's much more reassuring if you want to understand the language of, of those two groups. I'm somewhere in the middle, very liberal on human issues and much more conservative on uh, economics. Um, so, uh, be aware of your own myths and your own beliefs. And the best test for that is if you're angry with a student, angry with yourself, angry with a colleague, angry about something you're seeing on the road, angry about how your administration is, if the anger is just kind of a normal old crap, that's fine. But if the anger is visceral, then you've got some story or some myth that you better unpack and figure out what it is. Visceral anger is always that somebody's fooling with your story. Someone's tearing at your tapestry. And you could be totally right, but you need to take apart your own story to find out whether you inherited it, you just believe it, or it's still relevant. If it is, fine, go with it. Um, but it's important to understand that. Progress hurts, and reorientation, adaptation, always brings loss. We're always going to feel loss before we understand the next step. Um, I've been through a very hard grief process. And you never think in the middle of it you're going to be living happily ever after with a molecular biologist you didn't know existed, right? You just don't think that. Um, but you're alive. Excellence, which is what you offer, is a form of deviance and it will be punished. If you do your job and you do it well, you're going to upset somebody. 
and he'll be punished. And you just have to be prepared for that. Have some savings, right? Um, watch out for uh, free-floating anxiety. That's just what's in the air these days. That's why you have more aggression on the road. You generally have more aggression everywhere right now in the United States. There's lots of other examples. Figure out your priorities on a weekly basis and, uh, and do your best to live by them. Um, it's not easy, but it'll get you through some hard times. What's important to me? I ask myself over and over again what's truly important. And it sometimes gets me from here to there. Um, if you wonder about your students or wonder about your colleagues, um, one of the most important things to ask them what's important to them. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with a board or a high-level group of executives, and they haven't a clue what the guy next to them that they're trying to get everything out of wants. They've never asked. So if you're in any kind of a confusing or ambivalent situation, if you could just find a quiet time and say, where, where do you want to get to on this? What do you want? Where do you want to go? You might get just exactly what you need to make a modification in how you're teaching or in whatever the circumstance uh, is. Tell the new education story. And if I can help you beyond what all we've talked about, because I'm going to wrap up and I'll stay here uh, for a while if anyone has questions, but I know you're tired. Um, sometimes it's as simple as just talking about what do we want? What do the homo sapiens want besides survival? What do we want? We want to be happy. Right? What's happiness? All the oracles and the priests and the great teachers from the beginning of time have an answer. They all agree. Happiness is three things. And it's my understanding that that's what you do here. Number one, the belief you control your own destiny. That's why democracy is so wonderful. That's why education is so important. And whenever I'm teaching and I'm finding I've got a student uh, or a colleague or a situation where somebody is, there's trouble, I ask, do they feel unsafe? Because normally I'm feeling unsafe and I want to do something to them. But if I can reverse the question and I ask them, you know, are you feeling that you're really not in control? And if people feel they're controlling their own destiny, it just, things work much better. So you've got to find out why wouldn't they be that way. But what your normal thing is is what you do. That's what you do. You help people control their own destiny. The second element is uh, openness to new ideas. That's education, right? Openness to new ideas. The funny, hypocritical thing about education is how many teachers are not open to new ideas. I find that stunning. I'm always dealing with high school teachers who are yelling at their students. You have to be open. You have to listen. But they won't you know, <laughs> log in the computer. Um, so uh, the last um, is meaning beyond self. And it doesn't matter how you get it, whether it's a spiritual or religious meaning, uh, whether it is you know, raising puppies. Uh, meaning beyond self is something bigger than you, something more important than you. And to me, that's what teaching is. I am standing in this room. I am a farm girl first member of my family to go to college. My daddy only went to the eighth grade, though he did go through police um, uh, training, because of a teacher. My humanities teacher, Mr. Naimi, he was an Armenian, the only one I think that ever lived in Spokane, I don't know, came out to this farm community and he was our social studies humanities teacher. And I didn't have very good grades, and, uh, you know, I had a crazy family and um, he said, I think you should go to college. And I said, why? My pre-college differential guidance test said to stay home. <laughs> and he said, no. He said, I think you ought to go to college. And I said, well, we don't have any money. And he said, well, I want to go talk to your folks. So he went and talked to my folks, which is a waste of time, because they didn't think I should go to college either. But he entered me in the Betty Crocker Homemaker of the Year contest. And I won. Uh, and then you had to do a public thing. I baked a pineapple upside down cake, and I won that. And I got a scholarship, a home ec scholarship to the local agricultural college, which was Washington State University College then. And uh, in my first course, European History, Howard Payne, the top of my head lifted up, never dropped back down. Every September, which was the beginning of the world for me, it was always September, I wrote till he died, 
Mr. Neem. Mm -hmm. And I think, you are teachers. Some of you are administrators, I understand that. But you're in an educational enterprise at one of the most difficult times in history. It's heroic. It's impossible. What you're doing is incredibly difficult. Lots of people aren't going to notice it. They're not going to understand it. They're going to try to measure it. They're going to give you trouble. But what you're doing, uh, you need to understand at your core, uh, is probably the most important thing anyone could be doing right now in this country. Right. So I'm sorry that it took so much time. I promised you it would be shorter. I'll stay here for questions. But I want to thank you because for me, the community college level is the most important level. It's where kids who drop out of high school come and try to figure out the world again. It's where people who aren't going to go to university come. It's where people in midlife come. It's where everybody comes who is struggling in the hopes that you're going to help them move up through that Maslow hierarchy. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>